Um, just a few things to say. Um, I know there's been some questions about like what are we even doing? Um, you know, what is you know, what 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 was this even for? So I'm gonna start with that. Um, we do have a program that has a variety of things, um, education about what's going on, um, resources and that kind of thing. So we're really hoping that people can leave here today with some information at least, um, you know, how to be part of a solution um, when the problem itself is, is overwhelming. So, <clears throat> I really do appreciate you guys for being here. Um, there's a lot of people who help make this happen. Um, I know it, people probably think, oh, Claire's doing everything. I didn't. I definitely did not. I actually asked people for help, which is, I, I think, in, a thing in itself. But um, so for the past few weeks, I've been fully immersed in stories of recovery, um, stories of pain, you know, stories of what substance abuse disorder has done to people and families. Um, people are awesome. Uh, th that was the one thing. I know that there's, there can be a stigma when it comes to substance abuse disorder and um, there's a lack of understanding. And so as I've gone through this, I've had people reach out to me. I've made some new friends. Um, I, I've had a lot of conversations in the past couple weeks. And it all came down to one thing, and that is education. I've been educated. And my education started with Danielle. Um, I think it was like a year ago, I had posted something on Facebook, like I do, and... <laughs> I had said something along the lines and I used the word addict and Danielle messaged me and she said, you know, that word is, is hurtful, you know, and she explained why, you know, just something so simple as not even knowing what words to use. Um, because when you say something along the lines of that person's an addict, you're giving them a label. You're, you're just making it seem like they're just this disease that they're carrying around. Um, and I learned that from her, and I learned a lot from her. Um, so, usually, like, I, I have no problem finding words, and um, especially written word. It comes really easily to me, but I've, I've been struggling. Like, I, st I stared at my computer, I reworked sentences. Even what I have in front of me isn't, it's not right, because there's no words. And the real word that I found that I just, I, it's absurd. It's really absurd how difficult it is to get help, especially in this area. How much time it takes when somebody can say one minute, I need help, they need help that minute. And people are put on three week waiting lists um, and, and not to mention not to mention how much it can cost. Um, th there's a lot behind in, in all of the research and all of the stories and everything. You know, it comes down to one thing and one thing only. And we need a community of people who are willing to work together. And that's literally it. Um, and as long as we have a community of people, as long as we have the community support, if we can build a recovery-ready community, we can, we can really do a lot of good for a lot of people who need it. So there's a lot to it other than, you know, starting a center. And um, I believe you're going to talk about that a little bit. Or do you want me to? <laughs> all right so i don't want to steal too many of danielle's words but um you know it starts with this it literally starts with this and i as i've gone through the past few weeks and, and just talking to people i realize how many people are affected um and there's way more people that are affected than you would even realize i was 
the guys who were setting up the tent, one of them started talking about his son and how he needed prison in order to be able to get help. And that's where we're at right now. Um, and every, so every addiction story, it looks different. Um, from my perspective as an educator, especially a high school educator, my past with special ed and alternative ed, where I taught a lot of people here, and I've um, taught people that I've lost recently because of this. And that's the part that's really hard because when, when kids enter school, high school especially, it's not hard to look around and see which, which of these kids is gonna need the most support later on in life because they're, they struggle. And you see the struggle because they don't fit in a system. And that's a whole other story for a different day. But um, just know that in, in high school, we can, we can start making a difference. Mm -hmm. um, in the elementary schools, we can start making a difference. Even if it's just being a trusted adult, somebody that someone can go to without judgment. That's why a lot of people, um, you know, in education, a lot of our students turn to us because we, we're that trusted adult. So we learn a lot about people's lives and how hard it is for some of these kids. And everybody can do that. Everybody can just be a trusted adult, be a safe space, um, even if it's something that you don't wanna hear. That's the hard part. You don't, you don't ever wanna hear this from kids. Um, and I'm no stranger to you know, dealing with substance abuse. When I was younger, I had, I had a rough patch and I used things that today I would never even think of, of using, but it was very, I could have been this, this statistic as well. And I think a lot of us um, just assume that we're invincible. And, and the, the problem is, is that we're doing what we're doing. We're doing adolescents no favors if we're not giving them support with a disease that is prevalent in our community. Um, and so, there's a lot of misconceptions, and I hope that today we can uh, clear some of that up. And I promise you that if you see the two of us standing side by side, <laughs> working for something, it's, it's an act of God. It's called to yell. <laughs> it's important, is what I was going to say. Um, so, this is my sister Leanne, if you guys don't know. Um, and I'm going to turn the mic over to her so she can share her perspective. Okay, so I first want to say, starting with the I have no words, I'm, I'm just pinging off of what she said. When Danielle told me what happened, or actually Claire told me what happened, and I was so, I realized that everyone was going to be flooding Danielle's phone. So even though she's my best friend, I didn't even want to bother her. And my text message was like, I have no other words besides I love you. And she's like, that's all I need. And literally, that's all these kids need mm -hmm. growing up. They need people to show up. Um, the reality is right now, everyone's like, oh, a heroin overdose. It's not heroin anymore. It's fentanyl. It's everywhere. It's coming in through Mexico and China through mail and then now India. So we have all these other countries that are just shipping this out. Fentanyl is what can be produced without a farm. You don't have to grow it like the poppy seed for heroin. So people are making it in a lab and just shipping it out, lacing it with stuff, liquids, powders, whatever you think. And it's messed up. And these drug dealers are like making money off of this. It's really sad. The other thing is that In this area in Maine, we don't have a lot of resources. The resources we have, it's difficult to get to. Up here in Fort Kent, if somebody wanted to go to a methadone clinic, they have to drive an hour every day 
every day for at least three months, I, I would guess, until they could get a take home. Danielle, I'm saying one year. One word. Oh. Yeah. But three hours total. Right? Yeah. And that's just ridiculous. Like, nobody can do that in this area. So <clears throat> up here in northern Maine, we don't have anything available. And ironically, we do have Suboxone, but Suboxone makes people nauseous because they swallow it and it makes their stomach upset and people don't want to take it. And that's the true story. So we have this issue where we don't have enough resources available. And one of the things that Danielle said to me that struck me hard was when Michael had a barrier. And one of the barriers he said was, it is embarrassing. So it's hard for people to say, I need help and to go somewhere and to get the extra resources to get there. It's very difficult. They're not getting there and people are dying. The overdose rates right now are not even accurate, in my opinion. If you look it up, I don't think there's enough research available right now to even identify that. COVID has distracted everyone. And you send someone to the ER with this problem, they just want them out as soon as possible. You know, there's really a lack of resources. So it's so helpful that we have a community. Like, this is amazing. I'm so excited about this. And I'm so proud of my sister for doing this for my best friend. But everyone comes together, and that's that's what we need. You know, it takes a village to raise a child, right, Claire? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now um, that we're an emotional mess, I'm going to invite um, Sarah Bilbrun to come share her story. Um, Sarah is one of... Um, I, I remember her when she was little. She doesn't remember me, but, like, I grew up... Um, so I grew up kind of knowing, um, you know, what she went through, but um, she's going to share with you guys today, and it's a really lovely story. I love hearing it. Thank you so much. Um, hi, as she just shared, my name is Sarah, formerly known as Sarah the Show. I don't know. I see some familiar faces in the crowd, so I mean, hi. Yeah. Some people that I know and recognize, and... Um, so we, me and my family actually just recently moved back to the area. Danielle was our realtor, um, who was amazing, by the way. And um, so that's kind of where the connection here started for me. Was with Danielle. Um, so my story is a little bit different. And I say a little bit different, but I think there's a lot of people um, whose stories look similar to mine. Um, my addiction was one that started medically. Um, when I was born, um, before I was even born, my mom was told that there was going to be some complications with my health. Um, they didn't know the extent of the complications, but they knew that it was going to be severe enough that I would have to be born in Bangor. Um, I'm from the area, born and raised here. Um, and so we, or my parents had me in Bangor, and when I was born, it was quite obvious that there was um, bigger issues than they had expected. I was born with what is called Goddard's Syndrome, um, I have seven ribs on my right side that just never formed. I have a half a lung that never formed on my right side. I have scoliosis of 96 degrees in curvature. And, and the list actually kind of just goes on. The prognosis was that I wasn't going to live past the age of 10 unless there was a miracle. And so um, that began my parents' pursuit of how are we going to save my life. And um, as you know, we live in northern Maine. There's not a whole lot of resources here. Um, so they went and they brought me to Boston, and it was through Boston that they found um, an experimental procedure down in San Antonio, Texas, that was um, just at the beginning stages. There was only 14 people in the world at the time that had ever had the procedure. Uh, but the procedure would mean that I would have to undergo surgery every four to six months until I was done growing. Um, so that started at two. I was two years old. I was actually two days old um, the first time I had ever been surgery. And then began the uh, every four to six month journey that I went through at starting at two until I was done growing. Um, now I don't need to tell you that obviously with surgery comes pain and comes medication. And um, I did well uh, 
pretty much through my adolescent years of just taking it for pain. And there was even times I wouldn't even take it. I would just be sent home with Tylenol. Um, but towards my teenage years, as any teenager, you begin to struggle just with being a teenager. Um, I also grew up in a Christian home. My dad was actually a pastor, so I was a pastor's kid. Um, he fell into addiction when I was a teenager, and that kind of wrecked our home life. Um, here I had a dad that I looked up to and, and looked to as a spiritual leader, and to see his fall was just absolutely devastating. And um, Our home life became crazy. He was in and out of um, jail. There was just a lot that was going on in our home life, and that kind of began also my journey as a teenager towards drinking and partying and um, really walking away even from my faith because my faith was shook. I, I had seen um, this man that I looked up to fall, so it really caused me to be bitter towards God, and I, and I turned from that. Um, and so right around that same time, I had had a surgery in Texas that had been, I don't want to say botched, like I said, it was all experimental. They were trying new things. They had um, tried a, a procedure that would allow them to fix the curve that I had had in my neck and things had gone wrong and um, the rod that they had placed actually began to tear through my neck. And we're here in Northern Maine to get to Texas isn't just a, hey, get in a car and go. It took months. It took months of me living through that and that's where I had been put on pain meds long term. Um, that coupled with just some of the struggles that I was going through, I began to turn not uh, or turn to narcotics, not just for the physical pain, but even some of the emotional pain that I was really kind of going through at the time. Um, and that was the first time that I had ever experienced being addicted to narcotics. I remember going to get off, and I I had no idea they were even addictive. I was not educated. We talk about education, and I think. Uh, the, the medical world, you know, back then, I, I hope it's gotten better today, but was not educated, and, and um, I was put on a long term when I went to come off. I had experienced withdrawal for the first time. Thankfully, with the help of my doctor, with the help of my mom, I came off, but I had tasted it. I had tasted addiction. I knew addiction. I knew I liked how it made me feel, and it never left my mind. Um, so fast forward a few years, really continued to go down the road of partying and drinking and drugs, and um, it was through that life that I was introduced for the first time to, uh, to recreational use of drugs. And um, it didn't take long for it to get really bad. And I could sit here all day and tell you all about my addiction and everything that I did and Mindy, you're gonna make me cry. If you stop crying. Um, you know, I I stole from family. I stole from my parents, my grandparents. I did things that I was not um, proud of, and that brought a lot of guilt and shame. And you know, you talk about addiction, and it's a cycle, right? Because when you use, you do things that make you feel guilty and ashamed. And in order to cover up that. You continue to use, and you keep going in this, this circle, and in this, um, it's a horrible cycle that you feel like you get stuck in, and then you add the physical dependency on top of all of that. I tried several times um, with the help of my local doctor, and, and thankfully my family was a huge part, my mom, I should say, was a huge part in showing me tough love. You know, if there's parents in here and you're going back and forth of whether to show tough love, I'm, I'm here to tell you that tough love saved me in a big way. And um, she went right to my doctor and said, this is what's happening. Because I was abusing the system. I had learned to manipulate the medical field. I had learned to manipulate my doctor. And by the end of it, he had me on fentanyl, which to this day blows my mind. Um, so she went to him and, and told him everything that was happening. And that began kind of the beginning of my end in addiction. I had gotten sober that, that time. It didn't last very long. Um, I think I had about four months, and it did not take very long um, before I was right back to using again because there was things in me that needed to be healed. Um, it wasn't as simple as just staying off the drugs. Okay, the drugs were gone, 
but there was all of this stuff underneath the drugs that I had to learn how to work through to find healing from. I had to find forgiveness for the things that I had done. Um, and so, you know, I hear you guys talk about needing resources in this area, and I can't testify to that enough because when I began to look for help, it felt hopeless. There was nothing here. I remember walking into the ER here in Fort Kent and saying, I'm ready to get help. I'm done. I, I need help. And we couldn't even find a detox in the state of Maine to detox me. You know, so that began our search. Um, my brother as well, who had uh, struggled with addiction, he had done the 30-day rehab in Limestone. We had had that set up. I was planning to go. And in that time... I had found out about a resource in Bangor, Maine. It's called Calvary Residential Discipleship. Um, and it's faith-based, Christ-centered. I, I knew for me, I had to turn back to my faith in Jesus Christ. I knew I was angry towards him. I blamed God for a lot of things. But I also knew that's where I was going to find hope and healing. And so when this um, option was presented to me, I was hesitant because it was a year long, which is a very long time. Um, I was willing to give maybe 30 days or three months a try, but I think deep down inside I knew that six, seven years of using wasn't going to be fixed in 30 days or three months. And when I was told that it was a year, there was a part of me that just knew I needed that time to really get better and get well. So. I didn't even think about it. I said, okay, mom, sign me up. I'm going. I'm willing to go. And so I went. Um, I would like to say that when I got there, I was just excited about it, and it was great, and um, it was probably the hardest thing that I've ever done. It, it was a year. It was a year in front of me, and it looked impossible. Um, but in that first month of being there, I learned... Man, I learned a lot, but I learned that I needed forgiveness for the things that I had done. I couldn't forgive myself. I couldn't find it in me to forgive myself for the things that I had done. The guilt, the shame that kept me up so many nights, especially as I was getting sober. There's no longer drugs to, to mask the, the, the guilt and all of that. So it was as raw and real. And when I was there... Um, the, the director of the program began to, now this is a Christ-centered program, okay? And she began to, to share what Jesus had done for me on the cross and how he took my sin and my shame and all of that and that there was forgiveness for all of the things that I had done. I, that was the best news I had ever heard <laughs> because I had no idea how to forgive myself. I had no idea how to find restoration from everything that I had done and it was in that moment that I realized there was forgiveness and I began to forgive myself but I also knew that if he had done that for me that I wanted to live for the Lord and I knew and I was taught by uh, my mentors in this program that I couldn't live for drugs and live for Christ and so I told myself and I got on my knees and I prayed and I said I am going to leave all of that behind. I'm going to leave my drugs. I'm going to leave everything that has taken so much from me and taken so much from my family and the people around me. And I'm going to live for the Lord. I'm going to serve him. I don't care what it looks like. But I knew I couldn't serve both. I couldn't serve my drug and the Lord. So I chose, chose to serve the Lord. And um, So I spent a year in this program learning how to walk a sober life. It was, it was hard. Um, I knew that I had a love and a passion for the addict because I knew what it was like and I wanted to give hope to others. And so I was given the opportunity after the year um, in the program to stay on and work in the program and give back. Right, Part of the structure of this program is that you have people that have been in addiction that walk right alongside of you that help give hope. I remember so many times in the beginning of my program, seeing people that had been there a year and seeing how well they were doing, it gave me hope to keep going. Like, okay, it's possible. Like, you can do this. And so I was given that opportunity to kind of become a house mom, so to speak, in the program. Um, I did that for a whole other year. And it was at the end of that year um, that I was presented the opportunity to stay on and be hired on by the program and train under the director 
Um, so I did that for a few years. She mentored me. She trained me. I became assistant director at the program. So that's what I've been doing for the last 10 years. I've been sober now for 10 years. Um, I met my husband as well at this program. He's now going on five years of sobriety. Um, him and I both have two little girls together. You know, part of my medical journey was that I was never supposed to have kids because of everything that was wrong with me physically. And now we have two little girls. Um, we felt the pull to come back to the area. We don't know what all that entails for us, um, but we're happy to be here. And I, I hope that my story gives hope. Um, I can tell you that I, I am free. I, I have walked free from addiction. And um, I think people need to hear that, that there is hope, that you can be set free from these things. I don't wake up every day fighting not to get hot. I, I'm not going to say that I don't have days that are hard, but it's very far and few. Um, I've been given a hope. I have a family now. Um, I have things to live for. Uh, my addiction took from me. But it, took, it took everything from me, honestly. Um, and this freedom that I've found has now given me everything back and then some. And so I hope, as I, I share this, that it just gives hope that there is um, recovery is possible. So I actually want to say I'm recovered. <laughs> Like I said, I met some great people through this process, reconnected with some people. Um, our, the next person that's going to share is, um, her name's Amber, uh, and I'm not going to even try to touch her story because it's great, and um, Amber's giving back um, to her community, so she has a lot of resources to share. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Amber. Thank you so much for having me. I was asked to do this about a week ago. Uh, I am an individual in recovery. I've been in recovery from heroin and opiates for seven years and methamphetamine for almost five. Uh, I'm a recovery coach. I'm a Narcan distributor. I'm also a substance use counselor. Most importantly, I'm a mom. I am a mom in recovery. My journey starts out, uh, I'm from Southern Maine, and that's where I grew up. Uh, I met my daughter's father 10 years ago, um, and I never wanted marriage or kids until I met this man. Um, so we had a fantastic relationship. However, what wasn't fantastic was our opiate use. Uh, I started using opiates when I was about 17 and in a car accident and it kind of morphed from there. I dabbled a lot and then it wasn't until I met him that I started doing heroin. Uh, we lost everything and I mean everything, homeless, um, pawning our TV, writing bad checks just so we don't have to go through withdrawal. Then I found out I was pregnant with my daughter and thought, uh, okay, this is going to be it. Like. We're going to change. So it didn't change. I was about six months pregnant and he violated his probation and went to prison because he was using. So that's how I came up here. I was alone in Southern Maine and he didn't want me down there. My mother lived in Ashland and his mother lived in Fulton. So I moved up here, pregnant, alone. I had no friends. I lived up here for a year before I even knew anybody. I had my daughter and I had her emergency C-section. Never saw the inside of an operating room until then. Um, and again, my daughter's father wasn't there. He was in prison and my heart was broken. I had my daughter when we, we left the hospital. Um, I got postpartum depression. And I remember going to the doctor, begging for help, crying, begging for help. And I was told to get over it. And I was given a couple prescriptions for benzos and sent on my way. I then met my co-defendant and I stopped using opiates, but I started using amphetamine and used amphetamine for about two and a half years. Uh, my co-defendant was making shake and bake. So I was buying boxes of pseudoephedrine with the intent to have someone else make shake and bake. And I did this for about two years. And the more I used, the worse it got. 
none of my emotional problems were taken care of. My heart was still broken. And the only thing I knew how to do so I didn't feel was use. I left that situation and I happened to be there one day packing more of my, of my things. And that's when the DEA kicked the door in. Now I found myself arrested. I was being charged with aggravated operation of a meth lab and class B trafficking. I had never been in trouble. So my daughter went with her dad, because uh, he was out, out of prison, and went to Holton with him. And I spent about seven months altogether in jail. I got out a couple times, I violated, um, because I like to use substance and think I could still be on free trial while doing it. That does not work. Um, I finally got out the very last time and I was put on the Diversion Academy. And it was, it's basically a prison, prison Diversion Academy. So I either could get my stuff together or I'm doing four years in prison and I have a little girl. Within this time, I missed her third birthday in jail. And that is something as a mom that I will never, ever get back. I'll never get that baby's third birthday back. So I got out of jail and I had to make some decisions, very important ones. It was court ordered for me to go to NA and to do a group once a week. So I started doing criminal and addictive thinking at the recovery center in Caribou once a week. And I went to NA, brought my daughter. And I did this for about a year, till I got a year of clean time. Then I took the Recovery Coach Academy and became a recovery coach and started helping other individuals. Before I knew it, I was in contact with ACAP and their Workforce Development Program. They're funded by the NEG Opioid <coughs> Grant and helped individuals who are affected directly or indirectly by opiates go back to school and get an education, on the job training, and they help with so many resources. So I got connected with that resource and I went to school at Washington County Community College for their substance use and recovery program to be a certified alcohol and drug counselor. While going to school for that, I did a workforce development, um, on the job training. Um, uh, it was a uh, on the job training. They paid me to get uh, experience in the field. So I worked as the peer support specialist for their Suboxone clinic in Caribou and Prescott. Um, then I passed my exam and became a substance use counselor. I wouldn't be where I am today without the recovery center. I wouldn't be where I am today without NA. Um, it took me a very, very long time to be able to look at myself in the mirror and like what I saw. I looked at my daughter and said, how can, how, as her mother, how could I have done this to her? This baby went to bed at night not knowing where her mother was. Well, I was in jail. I didn't grow up like that. And me and that baby deserved far better. I can say now, five years later, uh, she's thriving and great. We have our own place in Presque Isle. Um and she is just the best little human ever. However, she comes from two parents that have substance use disorders, so she's 50% more likely to have one when she gets older. So what do I do? Well, I educate her. Mm -hmm. And I, con like, I constantly tell her, and all of these kids that I talk to, use your words talk about your feelings because some of the common denominators in my story and other stories that I've heard is trauma and it starts with trauma and not having the right tools to work through that trauma so we turn to substance so we don't have to feel when we get into recovery 
when you make that decision, that individual is legitimately at the lowest of their low. Their life is in shambles and they desperately just want somebody to say, it's okay, I understand. That's why I'm here today. It's so important that we get a recovery center here. We live in such a rural community. People cannot make it to Presque Isle. You can't make it to Caribou. We need services here. So that's what brings me here today, to tell you all about my journey, the resources that I have, um, and to raise money to have a resource place here for individuals that need detox, need a recovery coach, need outpatient therapy, or even MAT. So to have that here, that makes that those resources that much more acceptable, uh, that much more, um, I, I lost the word I was trying, accessible to individuals in the county. Um, thank you so much for listening to my story. Next, we have Miss Bailey Terrio, who's going to share um, her story. Hi. Um, this story is a little bit different, considering um, I'm an affected other, I guess is what you would call it. Um, also, I'm not very good at speaking, so I'm going to read, but hopefully it has the same effect. Um, my name is Bailey. And I've asked for my brother's permission if I could share his story from my perspective. Uh, I'm sure many of you know my brother Dexter. For those who don't know him, he spent about four years addicted to heroin and meth. And it started before that with pills and alcohol. He has been in recovery for two years now, since September of 2021. Thank God. Um, it wasn't an easy road to recovery. For one, it includes choosing to fight, to be sober every day, which will probably be lifelong. It also included having to rely on and then wean himself off of Suboxone. There was a point that I didn't believe that my brother was going to make it out of this alive. Like many people who are addicted, he struggled to maintain relationships, work, money. Anything to do with taking care of himself seemed <laughs> pretty near impossible. There were times that he was good at hiding his addiction, but most of the time he wasn't very good at hiding it and it would slip through the cracks. When it was bad enough, I didn't recognize my brother anymore and standing in front of me wasn't anyone that I knew. I was 17 years old and at that time the only person to know that he had a problem. It felt like I was keeping his secrets for him and trying to protect him at the same time. I didn't want to reach out to anybody because I didn't want Dexter to lose the trust that he had put into me. I also didn't want to be the one to tell my mom and my brothers because they would obviously be heartbroken. Eventually, I did end up handing it over to my family one night. I called them and I said that I needed help. It was while Dexter was having a really bad night. And there was a weight that immediately lifted off of my shoulders when I let go of the responsibility that I thought I had on his life. Mm -hmm. I was right that Dexter was going to be upset with me and that he would lose his trust in me. He felt condemned, backed into a wall, and like we were all against him. But I had to protect my well-being as well, and it took me a long time to realize that it was okay to take care of myself during that time also. It was what I needed to do. And with Dexter being sober now, I know that he can agree to that. That we've had to do some things that were not ideal when it comes to addiction, like setting boundaries. His life was withering away and his pain was so clear to see, and as a family we were at a loss. And I went to bed every night wondering if he would still be alive by morning 
and he went to bed every night in agony. I even received a text from somebody one morning that said, I can't believe what happened to your brother, and I'm so sorry for your loss. I realize now I had even envisioned my brother's funeral over and over for such a long time. I can't speak to, I can't speak for everybody, but there's no word to describe how it feels to watch the person you love fight between life and death every single day. I don't have all the answers, but I know that God is fair and just. And it's easy to be angry with God when the floor is ripped from underneath our feet. But I trust that he has a greater plan that's beyond our comprehension. And I also believe that recovery is possible because I've seen it. Dexter is and was determined, just like anyone who is seeking help. Dexter also fortunately had forgiving and graceful people in his life, like his boss Tony and his fiance Nico. But the, the point is, is that they extended their hearts to him when they didn't want to and didn't need to. And I would given up on Dexter many times before, as awful as that sounds. But the wall that I built didn't stay up for forever because I caught a glimpse of my brother fighting. And I realized it wasn't my brother who I gave up on, but it was the drugs and the stronghold that was on his life. You never truly give up on the ones that you love, even when we believe that we have. Let us pray for one another and be forgiving and extend our grace even when we don't feel like it. That is what makes a big difference. And I also have a prayer. God, while we don't always have the answers as to why we suffer, we are grateful that you are with us in our suffering. But if we're being honest, it can be easy to forget that you're near when we're lost in our grief. Sometimes the pain makes us numb, but at other times it tears us apart. When the weight of what we are walking through overwhelms us, remind us of your presence. Mm. Create something eternally beautiful out of our pain and help us to keep going. Show us how to rejoice in our sufferings so that suffering produces endurance, which produces character, which character produces hope. I know you are near the brokenhearted and save the crushed in spirit. Through, though sorrow surrounds us, remind us that joy is coming, even in our grieving. Let our lives bring you glory. In Jesus' name. All right. Thank you, Bailey. Um, next up, um, we have Kristen. I didn't think she needs an introduction. She'll tell you. Hi, everybody. My name is Kristen um, Bailey. I don't think I need to even speak now because I think you basically said everything that was in my heart. Um, so my name is Kristen Hafford. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces today but I also see um, some new ones, and I just want everybody here to know, um, I'm gonna start crying already, how much this really means to us. Um, and I see, uh, I won't point you guys out, but I see a few gentlemen in the room, um, in the area that um, are in recovery at this time, um, and I'm so proud of you guys, you know who you are. Um, so I'm going to try not to read from my papers, but when I get nervous, I forget my name. So um, I'm going to try not to be too long-winded today, but I do have a lot I want to say. Uh, so this is probably my fourth time telling my story. Um, and I feel like every time I finish, I always look back and I'm like, damn, I should have said that. Um, but the reality is, is that 27 years old, my story is still being written. So I'm a certified substance use counselor. Um, I started my career about two and a half years ago with AMHC. Um, I was able to get my feet wet in the field, um, get to know some local resources, and build a ton of community connections. <laughs> about seven months ago, I accepted a position at the Presque Isle Comprehensive Treatment Center 
which most of you know as the methadone clinic. Here, I work with individuals with severe and chronic substance use disorder, but specifically opioid use disorder. Uh, so as many of you probably know, um, I have a twin brother who has been battling between addiction and incarceration for at least the last 10 years of my life. It has been a continuous cycle of him getting into trouble, using drugs, going to jail, only to be released six months to a year later, where we then hit a roadblock due to his lack of motivation for treatment, but also definitely due to the lack of resources. Um, so the first few times, do I even need this mic? Can you hear me without? <laughs> um, the first few times he was released from jail, um, he came home to live at my parents' house, uh, but very uneducated and full of hope. Uh, we truly believed at the time all he needed was his family and a job to succeed. Little did we know at the time, not only was this in no way, shape, or form beneficial for my brother, but it nearly destroyed us as, an, as a family and as individuals in the meantime. Um, so just like there is no book on how to be a parent, there is no book on how to love an addict. Sorry, Danielle, I know you hate that word. <laughs> uh, so first of all, I want to talk about this small word that we all know a little too well, stigma. There's so much stigma attached to addiction. We have to stop putting every single individual who struggles with substance use disorder in a one box. I can't even begin to tell you the things I've heard people say about those who struggle. For example, that free Narcan is a waste of taxpayers' money. Um, that if they are dumb enough to use drugs, then let them pay the consequences, or that it's always a choice. For those people, I ask, what about the 35-year-old mother of three who is diagnosed with cancer and the only pain relief she can find in order to play with her children is by sneaking away to her bathroom to use heroin because her doctor will no longer prescribe the medication that she needs. And what if the heroin that she used on that day happens to be laced with fentanyl and she overdoses? Would we not want to use that Narcan to save her life? What about the 25-year-old girl who was drugged and sexually assaulted so much that her body became dependent on the substance and now she uses in order to not be violently ill every day? Would we not want to use the Narcan to save her life? And how about that 22-year-old man, male, who has just finished months of rehab, his tolerance for the substance has decreased, and he has one bad day, which leads to one slip. Maybe not even heroin or fentanyl, but maybe just another substance, and it happens to be cut with fentanyl. Because his tolerance is no longer, just that smallest amount leads to overdose. Would we not want to use the Narcan on that individual? You see, my brother was not always a woman-beating deadbeat father who would steal from anyone at any time and deserve to rot in jail as so many people have said. My brother was a beautiful, brown-eyed, brown-haired soul who would get on all fours and let me ride on his back around the house for hours. He was the best back scratcher when my mom and dad tucked us in at night and I would sneak in his room and we would lie on our backs and take turns scratching each other's backs until we fell asleep. He was the one who I could guarantee would never tell mom or dad what I did wrong because no doubt he had always done worse. He was my best friend, my partner in crime. He was my literal other half until drugs stole him from me. There are so many years, so many milestones, so many moments of my life that he was never part of that I would have done anything to have him be there for. I choose to continue to see my brother that way because I know in my heart that person is still there somewhere. Someone so capable of so much. There was a long period of time that I let myself believe that I was born his twin so that I could save him from his addiction. Of course now, through years of working through these feelings in therapy, I have relieved myself of that responsibility. I definitely still have my moments. I can never put into words how I felt over the years not having my brother as an active part of my life. Best way I can explain it to people is just this feeling of never being complete. 
I am for the most part a very happy person. I love life. I drive, I drive down the road in the summertime with my windows down, listening to my favorite music and think about how lucky I am. I ride my snowmobile in the wintertime with a smile on my face and think about how lucky I am. Everything I do, I am extremely humble, but it's never a happiness that's 100% because there's always a piece missing. An ache that never goes away and can never be fulfilled. A couple of years ago, after one of his longer periods of incarceration, he went to a sober living house. Me, my mom, and dad went for a weekend to visit, and he stayed with us at the hotel. Mom and dad slept in one bed, and me and him slept in the other. And that was the first night in so many years that my heart was 100% full. I remember watching him sleep and thinking that this could just last forever. When we were toddlers, um, he would do this weird thing with his pillowcase where he would, like, I don't know, he just, he would use his hand and he would, I don't know, like, there was a feeling of the pillowcase anyway. And when we were in the hotel room that night, um, he was doing this and I just couldn't stop watching him. It filled me with such an emotional feeling. <coughs> Sorry, I lost my place. Um, it was such an emotional thing for me, but in such a good way. When I got home on Sunday and I went to bed that night, I was laying next to my boyfriend and I couldn't help but feel such sadness. And I know that sounds horrible, but I wanted Camden to be my brother. I wasn't ready for that weekend to end. When I left Portland that weekend, I left half of my heart there. And sometimes I feel like that's where part of my heart will re remain forever. Another time after having been released from jail, me, my mom and dad went to pick him up to bring him home so that we could try to do what we could to give him some support and some direction. And I remember that first day of him being home, I could literally feel how badly he wanted to leave the house wanted to go see some friends and I knew in my heart that these were not the friends someone who truly looking to maintain sobriety would be looking to spend time with and I just remember asking him over and over and over if there was something he wanted to do if he wanted to go for a ride anything that I could do to occupy him to keep him in my presence if I could have stuck him in my back pocket I would have But I knew he was going to do what he was going to do at the end of the day. So sure enough, one of his friends came to get him that evening. And I watched him drive away heartbroken. Because spending time with me wasn't enough. And that's all I really ever wanted. I remember sitting on the porch with my mom and dad that evening, sobbing. My anxiety was so high. And telling them, asking them, how can I do this? I can't, this feeling of wanting to just hold him and keep him there, like, how long can I feel this way for? And I think that was probably one of the first moments of my first panic attacks I've ever had. We tried so hard to protect him from the inevitable, but he didn't have the tools he needed to succeed. It always ended up the same way, lying, deceiving, using, stealing, until my parents couldn't take any more and were forced to tell him that he needed to leave in order to protect their own sanity and their marriage. The admiration and the love that I have for my parents would save this world. There are so many things that they've done over the years, so much heartbreak that they've exposed themselves to, and I know in my heart that they only did it for me. I know a piece of their hearts broke a little bit more and a little bit more each time they had to tell my brother that he needed to pack his stuff and leave. But I know an even bigger piece broke every time that they had to pick up the phone to call me to tell me everything I had ever needed to make my heart whole again was gone. And for that, Mom, I know you're here. Dad, I don't know if you're watching. I love you and thank you.
this event and the purpose of this event and the work that I do every day means absolutely everything to me. I hear so often people say they need to hit rock bottom before anything is going to change. And you guys, I'm here to tell you that rock bottom is too late. Rock bottom is death. A recovery center, a sober living house, an intensive outpatient program, medicated assisted treatment, rehab, these are the things that we need to grab individuals before they hit rock bottom. The only rehabilitation my brother has ever had is spending most of his adult life in jail and a few month period at a sober living house where he didn't stand a chance because rent was about $800 a month. Food kind of included, but not really. And my parents not able to afford to pay rent for him, so that meant he needed to find a full-time job instead of being able to focus his days on getting the treatment he needed, building coping skills, and relapse prevention tools. 50% of my caseload at work are women, and I can't tell you what a barrier it is for women to get the help that they need because of the lack of resources for women with children. I ask at least one patient a week about rehab, and so many of them don't have the support system they can depend on to help them with their children, and very few rehabs will allow women to bring their children with them. So many incarcerated individuals leave jail 100% sober, only to return back to their old living environments because where else are they gonna go? So to wrap up, so to wrap up, I just wanna reiterate two of the most important things I hope to leave you all with today. The first, if you are struggling or you are the family member of someone who is struggling with substance use, please reach out for help. I didn't start taking my personal journey with my brother's substance use seriously until I was on the verge of a mental breakdown. I've had nights where I've held myself together in a ball and sobbed myself to sleep. I've had nights where I've had too much to drink and it left me rolling around crying on the bathroom floor. I've had moments where I've begged God to give me my brother back and to make the pain stop. I've had moments of physical altercations with people that I love for trying to give me advice that I wasn't ready to listen to. About four years ago, even though it forever seems like yesterday, my brother was in, a, in one of his darkest places we've ever seen. And at this time, a video of him from years ago ended up being posted on Facebook. In the video, he had owed some people some money and it was clear that they wanted him to square up or they were gonna hurt him. It was also around this same time that a call came over the scanner that he had overdosed. And while it was one of his darkest times, it was also one of mine. I had moments of literally telling myself that I would start using substances too. Because if something ever happened to him, I wanted him to die with somebody who actually loved him. Guys, these are the things that we rationalize in our minds for people we love. Now, 10 years later, I have come miles from the person who rationalized these thoughts, and I continue to work on it every day. Being an affected other of someone who struggles with addiction, some days feels like grieving the loss of someone who is still here. It is an agonizing pain, but being able to be here today, tell my story, hear other stories, and just be around a community with a shared experience it's so important. It doesn't make us to feel good to know that others are struggling the same way that we are, but there is a feeling of not being alone and that's so important. This event, raising money to put together a recovery center, is going to allow individuals to have that. It's going to allow that teenager who has been prescribed stimulants or benzos that recognizes they are starting to abuse them, but are too afraid to tell a family member to reach out for support and to find out where they can get some help if and when they are ready. This recovery center is going to allow us to intervene with those who are in the pre-contemplative stage of change before they hit rock bottom. This is gonna open the door to more people having an open mind when it comes to substance use. 
This, I know in my heart, is the start of something that is desperately needed. Thank you for taking the time to hear my story. Um, first of all, I, I'm i looking around and I am I'm truly amazed at the people that are here. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna give you guys what I expect from everybody else and what I'd always tell Mike is, um, I just want people to be honest and I'm gonna be honest with you guys. It sucks standing up here. It sucks listening to people tell recovery stories when my son doesn't have that and he will never get that, okay? It makes me mad. <laughs> it makes me mad that my daughter doesn't have her brother. And um, I take I take that feeling of madness and anger and I know it's it's not useful, right? So I really am thankful that there are recovery stories even though Mike didn't get one. Um, he, he gave me a lot while he was here. He taught me a lot. There's absolutely nothing I wouldn't have done to take Michael's addiction away from him. Um, I, I am thankful for everybody that um, donated prizes. I didn't ask for, I didn't ask for this. I posted on Facebook a couple times to sell tickets, but I did not ask for this. I was, um, I was just talking to Claire, and I said, I, you know, I want to do something. I, I want to start something in Mike's memory. I want to be able to help people. And I, I wanted to help Mike. Um, and I know that everybody, not everybody has somebody like, like Michael had in me, like Michael had in his sister. Um, it, it makes it hard. And I think the more people that somebody has, a better chance they have and they, they need to know that these people care honestly I I think you know people message me and you know this is awesome what you're doing and I'm like I don't know what I'm doing I, I don't and I I couldn't save my son so how, how the heck am I gonna save anybody else right but it wasn't up to me to save Michael um, and and I learned that um, through Mike's journey through Mike's struggle with addiction there's many times that I, I thought I was saving him that I was saving him I was saving him from consequences <coughs> of his own actions um, Saving him maybe from the next high, the, I don't know, I mean, I threw drugs away, <laughs> I called the cops, uh, there's, I, I tried everything, um, sent him to three rehabs, sent him to detox centers, um, or one detox center put him through sober living. When when Mike first reached out to me and wanted help, it was um, it was it was right around my birthday. Um, twenty twenty two. So March twenty twenty two. He called me and he said um, that he was he was ready. He wanted to go get help and I was I, I had finally, I figured out through Naranon meetings, 
that I needed to take care of myself in order to be present for my son. Um, let's actually rewind. So January of 2022, when I thought I was saving my son, um, I, I had cameras on the building where Michael was living and, and seeing the local fentanyl dealer show up at the house. They're, they're loading a tire rim into the trunk of the car. And I'm like, I paid for that rim. <laughs> so I call the police station and um, get the police over there. I said, I want a no trespass order served on this person. So I probably have a record in Fort Kent for the number of no trespass orders served on different people because I thought, I just can keep this person away from Mike or this person away from Mike because they're bringing him drugs, you know? Um, that, that didn't really work well. Anyways, the cop showed up, kid left. Somehow the kid ended up back there and then it was a snowboard. So the snowboard was Mike's and he could give that to his, his friend for for some drugs. Um, the cop went back there and made the kid leave again. It was uh, about 1.30 in the morning. I had woken up and um, so it was only, I just pretty much fallen asleep. I woke myself back up and I, I went back on my cameras on the phone and Michael was face down in the snow by the dumpster and it was below zero. We were having 30 to like 50 mile an hour winds. And I thought, oh my God, like my son is, my son, my son is overdosed in the snow next to the dumpster. Like what the hell just happened? So I'm running around the house trying to find something to throw on and just get down to the building. I'm like, no, I'm calling my cop back, Mike Parody thankful that Mike went over to check on him and he got him up and you know he, he told Mike if your mom hadn't seen you on the camera you you wouldn't have made it out here like nobody would have seen you on the side of the dumpster um, and it's freezing cold out here and you're literally in your slide and a, a little jacket and um, he talked to him a little bit and, and Mike had you know, he would, he would detox at home. He was on maintenance and maintenance <coughs> for people that don't know, I mean, it's, they're taking Suboxone, they're prescribed a certain amount and they, they can not take some for a little bit so that they can get high and they figure out pretty well how to do it so that they can use it to be present and then not use it so that they can get high when they don't have to be around their family and and i would take that michael over dead michael any day um so so if you hate on maintenance i mean it, it's it's a pathway and just just be more accepting of these things but anyways um something else happened and maintenance kind of went out the window and, and Mike started spiraling again. And, and that's when um, I, after that night, I said, I, I need help. Like I'm literally gonna die trying to help my son. And, and so I tried finding an r and meeting um, and I didn't have much luck except for like Colton. And I'm like, I'm not driving three hours or whatever it is to, um, to try and go to a meeting. Um, so I found one online and I found a great group in Maryland and um, I got by one group without talking and then the <laughs> second second uh, meeting they made me talk and um, it, it just it helped a lot. I, I mean I, I still talk to these people. I don't I'm not faithful with my meetings. Um, I kind of struggled with the idea that I struggled with the idea that I, I still struggled with the idea that I didn't have a role in this, right? So like you didn't cause it, you can't control it. Um, I, I think there's 
you know, I think there's a issue with that. And I may not be able to control him, but I can tr control myself. And if I'm fighting with him, that's not beneficial for his recovery. So that's kind of why I stepped away from my, I have friends that I still talk to in Maryland um, that I met through that meeting, but I just, I didn't, that's where I was kind of like, oh, I'm not sure about that. Um, and, you know, uh, when we start getting better at something, we kind of just like, oh, we don't need that anymore. Just like people do with medication, I guess. Um, but, uh, let me see here. I, <laughs> I had all sorts of things to say and I knew that by listening to everybody else I would kind of drop some of these things and then pick up other things but um, This is the beginning of my book. <laughs> I'm a lot further into this than I realized. <laughs> um, okay, so I didn't want people to come here to feel sorry for me, and I didn't. Um, I didn't want to, for lack of better words, shit on any services in the area. But there's that that was what I that was what I came across with trying to help Mike is just yeah, when he wanted to go to detox, um, we got we'll call back tomorrow, there's no beds available. Okay. Um, when he wanted to go to inpatient, uh, there's a three week waiting list. So try again tomorrow. And, and Mike um, detoxed many times <coughs> without, without a um, medical center. But, you know, the first time I'm like, we're going to do this right. I'm going to get you to a, a medical center. I drove him down to Portland when the place that his, he was on main care, when the place I think there's two detox centers in the state right that accept me here so they wouldn't um, they didn't have a bed or I don't even know it was it was just unbelievable this like the barriers that I the walls that I like would get to you know um, so I drove him I, I paid out of pocket and I drove him to Portland and um, and, you know, do the next thing and get him to a good impatient. But the truth is, is when Michael would detox, um, go through his withdrawals, he often was home and we'd say, okay, like we're going to find, we're going to find a rehab to go to, right? And Michael was all about it for four days, for about four days. So three weeks doesn't it doesn't cut it and I again I'm not a medical professional I've educated myself over the past I don't know how many years um, and and I've listened to everything Michael told me his story he started using um, around the age of 13 years old and I, I didn't have a clue. Like I, I wish I had known sooner things to look for. I, I wish that I wasn't naive and thinking, oh well, I drink and I did these things when I was that age, so it's it's fine, right? Like it's a phase. He'll he'll get through it. And I. I it's science. I mean, my brain doesn't work the way that somebody with a substance use disorder, their brain, his brain worked differently than mine. Um, it, I tell people, Michael was bit three times by a dog, by different dogs growing up. But the kid loved dogs, was obsessed with dogs. Most people that would be bit by a dog, 
they wouldn't go next to the dog again, right? Like I wouldn't. Um, but he he had a he had a need for <laughs> things that made him feel good, and what started with pot very quickly led to opioids because there was many adults that were being prescribed them. Um, so we all know about that. But anyway, so my, my goal was to create awareness um, to, to try to get people together to realize that we do need services in St. John Valley, that we cannot pretend that there's not a problem. We, we can't pretend like this is just If we do pretend, there's going to be more. There's going to be more people. Um, so, so yeah, I, I found a location. I have talked with so many different people, um, and so the funds raised will <coughs> go towards a center to start with. And in addition to that, when I have my goals fun set up. I want to be able to, like I said, help people and give people what was easy enough for me to do for my son that's not easy for everybody else. So it, again, like it's a couple thousand dollars sometimes to get them into an inpatient out of the area. Sometimes it's 30,000, sometimes it's 2,000. Um, to get them through detox, it's seven grand if you don't have insurance. Um, it, it, and let me let me just bring this up also. When I uh, when Michael went to when Michael detoxed in May before he went to McShin Foundation in Virginia, he called. There's a there's an inpatient in the Lincoln area. He called. There was three week waiting list, and I said, Mike, we've been through this before. You don't have three weeks. Figure it out. Um, <clears throat> We tried to get him into Milestones in Portland, and he had only, he was still testing positive for fentanyl, okay? He had went through the detox withdrawal for four days. He had been throwing up all that fun stuff, and he was feeling okay. Um, so we called, and they wouldn't take him. They said, oh, you're fine now. Like. You, you've gotten through the hard part. Last night I was talking to somebody else and they said, no, you're not fine after four days. That's going to start right back again. So they wouldn't take him because it, they had beds. They told me they had beds, but they would not take him. So I'm like, well, okay, then we don't have a choice. You're going to inpatient. So I don't think he was ready to go to inpatient now like in hindsight, but at that time I thought, these are the professionals, right? They're telling mm -hmm. me that he doesn't need to go to detox, he's, he's good to go to inpatient. Um, and he, he went through inpatient, he seemed like he was doing good. Um, I don't know <laughs> the complete truth. Michael was pretty good at um, hiding his use, but I do know that by educating myself, by going to the, by attending the Naranon meetings, by reading these books, by talking to people that had been in my shoes, when he came here for four days in August, his last days that I spent with him, I had a nice visit with him. When I dropped him off at the airport, we had the best hug. Um, when I talked to him for the last time, um, Saturday night on August 12th, it ended with, I love you, good night, I love you, talk to you tomorrow. It was, you know, there's times that the last time I talked to Mike was, it wasn't good. He was threatening to kill himself through overdose or put his truck into a telephone pole. Um,
I'm thankful that I, I at least had those last good days with him. Um, if that's I'm again. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, I, I hope I didn't come off as being mean when I said I, I hate hearing. I hated hearing recovery stories, but I don't hate recovery stories. I, I do love them. It just sucks to, to know that my son's not going to get that. My sister's, my sister's nephew, my daughter's brother. I kind of want to say something about what you said. So the fentanyl thing, when I guess Michael couldn't go to rehab or detox because he had tested positive for fentanyl, but the reality is this fentanyl will stay in your system for weeks after you last use. So people are providers and they don't know what they're doing. They don't know how to do their job and I'm sorry to be such an asshole, but that's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> So, Danielle said, let's be honest, Leon took it and ran. Um, so, there's a few things um, that I just want to touch base on before um, I hopefully can make food. I think it's ready. Anyway, um, is I, I alluded to a recovery-ready community. Um, and so, I just want to explain what that means because if you're here, you know, you're already here supporting us. If you're watching from, from wherever you are, you know, you're already here supporting us. But the problem is, is that I'm sure that there are many people who are affected others who are in recovery that can tell you that the hardest part about this is the shame, right? It's already hard enough to go through what you're going through, but then you walk around the community, it's such a small community, right? That's the thing, you know, you we need to be ready for recovery and in order to do that um our community needs to have a good combination of access to treatment which is is what we're working on first um employment opportunities and so that's where um you know we connect with acap um you know and connect people with the resources they need um, find employers who are recovery ready employers. It's really hard hiring somebody who you know maybe six months ago did awful things when they were addicted. It's hard. <laughs>